Southeastern New England's hottest rock all day long. Good morning. You are listening to the Alex Fuse Show, bringing you all of the news, sports debates, interviews with people you all care about, and so much more. Every single weekday on Dean College Power 88 Radio, broadcasting live from 7 to 8 a.m. And now, here's your host, Alex Hughes. Good morning, everyone. Happy Wednesday morning. Once again, Alex Fuse here, bringing you up until a little bit earlier today because we do have an e-commerce conference here on the Dean College campus this morning. So we'll be ending the show a little bit early so I can get over there for that starting at 8 o'clock this morning. But we have a lot of stuff to talk about today. Game one of the World Series was last night. The Nationals derailed Garrett Cole. And this was a big moment for Juan Soto, 20 years old, and was able to overcome the best pitcher in the world, Garrett Cole. We'll also be talking about the Patriots. They made the news yesterday with a trade. And how important is that going forward this season? And also the speculation surrounding Tom Brady and his houses. Also top five news headlines of the day and so much more. But starting off the show this morning. The World Series, game one of the World Series last night. The Washington Nationals were able to defeat the Houston Astros. And I said on the show yesterday that I have the Nationals in six games, and they started off huge. The first game typically goes for the person that is going to win the series. And just last night, the Nationals did that. A big victory over Garrett Cole. Now anyone on the Astros rotation can be beat by the Nationals. That's the big difference right there. Justin Verlander on the mound tonight for game two of the World Series, and he struggled in the playoffs. He struggled against the Yankees. Verlander 0-4 with a 5-6-7 ERA and five World Series starts. He got this far with Detroit in 2006 and 2012, and then in the Astros in 2017 when they ended up winning the World Series. But on the mound tonight for the Nationals, Steven Strasburg, he's 3-0 with a 1-6-4 year right in the National League playoffs, and he went 18-6 and and set a career-high wins during the regular season this past season. Let me tell you something, everyone. If the Nationals go up 2-0 in the series tonight, the Houston Astros are not winning the World Series. They're not. This series... Between the Astros and the Nationals, first of all, the Nationals, if they are able to beat the Astros, right, they would really defy all the odds. Honestly, who would have even thunk if you talked to someone in June of 2019 and told them that this Nationals team was going to the World Series and potentially win the World Series against the Houston Astros, Everyone would have laughed in your face. This Nationals team, going back many months, they struggled at the beginning of the season. At one point, they were almost 15 games below 500. 15 games below 500. They were a wild card team. They were able to beat the Dodgers. They swept the Cardinals. And then, here we are right now. Nationals up 1-0 in the series against the Astros in the World Series. And now they got one of their best on the mound tonight, Steven Strasburg, who is honestly one of the most underrated postseason pitcher in all of baseball. Again, the stat line proves it. He's 3-0 with a 1-6-4 ERA in the playoffs. And then again, Chosberg, who had a phenomenal season, but again, went under the radar. It's kind of tough when you are the number two behind Max Scherzer, who's pretty pretty good as well. I mean, Max Scherzer and Steven Strasburg and the rest of the Nationals rotation is a pretty good matchup to the Astros rotation. It's not so much in your face as a Justin Verlander, a Garrett Cole, a Zach Greinke, 
And then when you got the guys that you do in the Astros bullpen that can just maneuver their way through trouble. And then you talk about the Astros offense that is so hard to keep quiet, but the Nationals were able to do so last night. If the Astros are looking to strike back tonight and try to even this series one apiece, they are going to have to knock Steven Strasburg out of the game as early as possible. And it's going to be hard to do because Steven Strasburg, again, one of the best pitchers in baseball, and if not one of the best, the best in the playoffs, Steven Strasburg. And if they are able to knock him out of the game early and expose the not-so-great Nationals bullpen, well, now you're looking at a 1-1 series going into Washington for three games. And now anything can happen. It's tougher to get wins back in Houston after the first two games. Historically, Houston struggles in the first half of the series. Look at the Yankees. The Yankees were able to win game one of the American League Championship Series. And then the Astros won game two and game three and game four in New York. But then the Yankees were able to extend it to a game six, then end up losing on a walk-off two-run home run by Jose Altuve. And now the rest is history. Now that's how the Astros got to the World Series. But again, the Nationals beating the Dodgers beating the Cardinals. And now they're all going up against the Astros, who is now termed the best team in baseball, the Houston Astros. A lot of people were also saying that whoever won the matchup between the Yankees and the Astros are going to win the World Series. But the Nationals are trying to make everyone look wrong and to prove everyone that this is a team that should not be messed about. And they're doing a pretty well job at it right now. Once again, game two of the World Series tonight. Steven Strasburg on the mound for the Nationals. Justin Verlander on the mound for the Astros. Verlander got beat by the Yankees. Can he get beat by the Nationals? We'll find out tonight. But again, that's an exciting matchup. But Juan Soto, 20 years old. They called him a prodigy. And he has a passion for the big moment. Soto homered onto the train tracks high above the left field wall and had a two-run double as the Nationals really got after Garrett Cole. He said after the game, he quote, after the first at-bat, I just said, it's just another baseball game. And the first at-bat, I'm not going to lie, I was a bit shaking in my legs. And again, talk about a history-making home run. Also, we saw Ryan Zimmerman as well. And then it's just been a great series for Juan Soto. Unbelievable series. And Juan Soto is a star. Let me tell you something. This is a a team where this... Decade in baseball, right? We look at all the rookies in baseball and all the prospects in the game today. You got guys like Rafael Devers, who's in his low 20s. You got guys like Labor Torres, who's 22. Juan Soto, who's 20. All these great guys that are so young in this game. Carlos Correa, Alex Bregman. I could go on and on and on about all these great players. Arnon Alvarez, he's 22 especially on these specific teams that are currently playing in the World Series. The future of this game of baseball is perfectly fine if you put it in the hands with these talented, passionate baseball players that truly love the game. And that's who these people are, right? I mean, growing up, you grew up watching Derek Jeter and David Ortiz and... Ichiro Suzuki, Alex Rodriguez, all these top guys, Ken Griffey Jr., Pete Rose, all these great guys, Hall of Famers, future Hall of Famers. That's what's different about the game of baseball. You have a chance to really 
fall in love with the game over and over and over again, no matter who's on the field. It almost feels new, right? Every so years, you get a, a big batch of new rookies that are taking over the game popularity, and, and that's what we're seeing today. We are seeing these guys taking over the game, and rightfully so. The game needed a refresh, especially when you have guys that were the face of the MLB for many years, and then they start retiring and getting out of the game. you got to find the new ones to come up. And the MLB has no problem with that right now. The MLB is stacked with talent through and through. I mean, just think about it. Only four out of 30 teams did not make the playoffs in the last 10 seasons. That's unbelievable. The Rockies did it. The Marlins did it. The White Sox did it. Truly spaced out, fresh, and new. Every single day in this game of baseball. That's what it is. That's what's special about the game. There's something special about this game of baseball, and especially in the playoffs. And if you're a sports fan, you know exactly what I'm talking about with playoff baseball. There is nothing like it. If you could tell me right now, again, I'll restate what I said earlier. If you would have told me that the Nationals would be going up against the Astros and possibly win the World Series this year, I would have told you you're crazy. But here we are. Alex Hughes bringing you up until a little earlier than the 8 o'clock hour this morning, but we have another pack show for you. We're talking World Series Game one, debrief right now. A big win for the Washington Nationals. Game two tonight, Steven Strasburg and Justin Verlander on the mound for their two respective teams. Strasburg for the Nationals, Verlander for the Astros. We'll also be talking about the New England Patriots. And why is Tom Brady's houses in the news? Coming up next on Power 88. Alex Fuse here on Power 88 Radio, broadcasting live from Dean College. Why is Tom Brady's house is in the news? Well, reports out there in the world saying Tom Brady, quote-unquote, setting up to move on from the Patriots, NFL insider theorizes. Rumors about Tom Brady's departure from the New England Patriots world Monday night after an NFL insider Adam Schefter theorized that there were signs a six-time Super Bowl winning quarterback was plotting an exit. Adam Schefter, who we've had on the show before, one of the most respected sports journalists in football, attempted to connect the dots on Brady's future during the network's Monday night countdown broadcast prior to the game between the Patriots and the New York Jets. He said, quote, let's boil this down to the basic facts once again, Schefter said. Looks like, let's look at some simple things. Has he put his home for up for sale? Yes. Has his trainer put his home up for sale? Yes. Has he set up his contract to void after this season to become a free agent? Yes. So if he's selling his house and his trainer is selling his home, and he's voiding his contract, what does that tell you? He's setting up to move on. Schefter added, there are many times people set up things in their lives to move on, and they walk to the abyss, look down, and say, whoa, I'm not jumping now. So he could change his mind. But again, the theory, I don't buy it. But it does make sense, right? Why else would Tom Brady put his house up for sale? Why else would Tom Brady's trainer put his house up for sale? And why would Tom Brady make sure, after signing a a multi-year deal, to then go back and change it to make it void after this season? It's a confusing theory. Why would he do that? I mean, he's playing just as good as he did 10 years ago. Maybe not to the extent, but he's still Tom Brady. And he's still, I mean, look, Let's face it, the Patriots 7-0. Maybe, just maybe, if the Patriots were 500 or if they felt like they were struggling and just finding wins because they were beating up on the poor teams of the NFL. But Tom, come on now. This is one of the best defenses the NFL has had. 
for the Patriots, that is. And also, in this game of football, in today's world, this is one of the most safest times to be an NFL quarterback. It is so tough for quarterbacks in the 2019 version of football to get hurt. Yes, we see the fluke injuries, just like Patrick Mahomes went for a quarterback sneak and dislocated his right knee, but fluke injuries happen every day in sports, and it's one of the worst scenarios to happen. But, again, Tom Brady selling his house means that he's retiring? Uh, I don't buy it. He bought a house in Connecticut. But maybe he'll be the head coach at UConn. Schefter went on to say he didn't clarify what move on meant, whether it means to move on from the Patriots or to move on from football altogether was unclear. It is also certain that Tom Brady, who's 42, did put his Brookline Mass home on the market in the summertime, as is his trainer, Alex Herrero, with his Norfolk home. And it says if he's planning on moving, it appears it would be news to everyone. Brady, who put up 249 passing yards and a touchdown in it over a 33-0 win over the Jets, doesn't appear to be finished playing football just yet. And that's the thing. The Patriots, if all goes right the rest of the season, are right back in the Super Bowl, just like they are almost every year. And now they're set up to win number seven. Seven Super Bowl rings. Man, if you're a Patriots fan, you must be feeling pretty good right now. Pretty much across the NFL, a lot of teams are struggling to stay consistent, but the Patriots are able to do that every single year. It's unbelievable to think about. Tom Brady, Bill Belichick, Edelman, All these guys, before Gronk retired, the mainstays of the New England Patriots, the marquee names, the faces of the franchise, are able to stay consistent week through the week of the long, grueling NFL season at some points for other teams. But the Patriots make it look like it's a cakewalk. Patriots also were in the news on Monday morning they made a trade to acquire Mohamed Sanu from the Atlantic Falcons and this was a big trade for the Patriots as well a a nice pickup for the Pats especially if you're a fan Tom Brady going on to have another target Sunday against the Cleveland Browns after the the New England Patriots acquired wide receiver Mohamed Sanu from the Atlanta Falcons for a second-round draft pick in the 2020 NFL Draft. So new 30 years old, 33 receptions for 313 yards, but only has one touchdown so far this season. He's an eight-year NFL veteran who's tweeted his excitement about joining the Patriots and thanked the Falcons organization. And this is a story that now Tom Brady has another weapon. It comes midseason going up against the Cleveland Browns, who can be a little test. Baker Mayfield and the Browns have struggled this season. But they could they could put up a good test for the Patriots. To face a high-caliber offense, that, well, that's something they really haven't done besides the Bills. Baker Mayfield and Ezekiel Elliott potentially pose that threat. So we'll find out this Sunday if the Patriots are able to hold together going up against the high-caliber offense like the Cleveland Browns, and that the Browns are able to do what no one, no other seven teams could do, beat the Patriots this season. Patriots, once again, 7-0. Tom Brady with another target this Sunday, and Mohamed Sanu. Should be an interesting matchup between these two teams, and it should be an interesting story to continue to follow about Tom Brady setting up to move on from the Patriots and the NFL. It seems almost like every single season we're talking about, is this the year? Is this the year Tom Brady in New England is no more? Well, I'm sure we'll be finding out in the next few weeks whether or not this story adds up to anything true or if it's just speculation. 
What do you think? You're a Patriots fan, and you're hearing the news. Tom Brady has been around for a very long time in the NFL, 42 years old, and playing better than anyone at this stage of the game. Do you feel like this move is setting up Tom Brady to move on from football? Well, tweet us out on the show, at the Alex View Show, on Twitter and Facebook, and you can message me on Twitter and message me on Facebook and give me your thoughts and opinions on this story. Coming up next, top five news headlines of the day. What's in the news today? Find out next on Power 88. Welcome back to Power 88 Radio, broadcasting live from Dean College. Alex Fuse bringing you up until a little before the 8 o'clock hour this morning as there is a leadership conference on the campus this morning that starts at 8 o'clock, so we have to get over there for that. Hey, top five news headlines of the day. Headline number five. Again, the World Series last night. The Washington Nationals were able to pull off an upset over the Houston Astros, not in uh, in a way that obviously there are people out there, including myself, that thinks the Nationals are going to win the World Series. But when I talk about upsets, they're facing the best pitcher in baseball, Garrett Cole. It was the last loss of the game in the month of May. and But they were able to do so last night. But what's interesting about this story is the Astros roster. And why is that? Well, the Astros have no left-handers on their pitching staff for this series. It's the first time a club has gone into the World Series without a southpaw, a left-hand pitcher, since 1903 as the Red Sox and the Pirates in the first World Series. That is insane. Listen to this. The last time a team did not have a left-hand pitcher in the World Series on a roster in the World Series was the first year. That's that's something that, I mean, who would have ever thought? I mean, left, and this could possibly be the end of, I mean, look, next season there's a new rule taking effect in the game of baseball where you have to keep a pitcher in there to face three batters. So, well, the lefty specialist is now unemployed, right? The Yankees did it in extra innings against the Astros in Game 2 of their championship series where they brought in three pitchers in one inning. CeCe Zabathia, Luisinha, and J.A. Happ. They did it, ended up losing, but they got through that one inning, but that will be no more in 2020. So, once again, the Astros have no left-hand pitchers on the roster. The first time since 1903 in the first World Series. Max Scherzer was able to hold off the Astros 5-4 last night. Soto delivered a solo home run and a two-run double while the Nationals were trying well, they were going up against, again, the best pitcher in baseball, Garrett Cole. They were already falling behind 2 well by the Astros offense, but they were able to fight back and get the lead, and that was a crucial lead. And also, the bullpen was able to hold on to that lead, which is surprising. Very, very surprising. Headline number four. The Buffalo Sabres in the NHL. Continue their turnaround after finishing with the NHL's fifth worst record last season. The Sabres are a league's best, 8 and 1 with one tie. After Jake Eichel scored into the overtime to give them a 4 3 win over the Sharks on Monday, Eichel also talked or in the second period, and, and this is a story that's pretty cool, right? The Buffalo Sabres turning things around after finishing after the NHL's fifth worst record. And now they're 8-1 with one tie. Headline number three. This is a story that's not really a news story. It's more of a story. I'm going to tell you why. Well, it's a story from the Brooklyn Daily Eagle. By Alex Williamson. 
about how to tell a scary story. This is October. We're just a few days away from Halloween. That's next Thursday. And well, they want, she wrote a whole article about how to tell a scary story. First, you have to give it a sense of direction, right? I said, we've all been trapped someplace with a story where you've kind of felt lost by the thread, and it seems like the storyteller doesn't know where it's going either. Hopefully not on this show. But you start to feel rudderless. Good storytelling, you feel that the person telling you is in command all the time and knows exactly where we're going next. So that's the first piece, to never lose sight of where your story is headed. Practice writing it down or telling it to friends before busting it out in a higher stakes situation like on stage in front of a crowd of strangers. She then says, something has to happen, preferably something unexpected. Their stories aren't real about a day that went just as planned. Unless, of course, your plan was, I'm going to take over a country or something. Furthermore, as she's saying, Hickson's story says that storytellers should begin their story closer to the key action rather than giving the audience too much exposure and risk of losing their attention. Hopefully, I'm not losing everyone's attention now. There are a lot of people who do a lot of describing, who set the scene a lot, so if you can close your eyes and picture what we are talking about, it's a dark, rainy night. You can see a little fog off the distance, and you see an old house. And the house has holes in the walls, and you can see spiders crawling out the windows. There you go. There's a little storytelling for you. Something needs to be at stake. Someone's missing, and we need to figure out who it is. We hear screams from the background, something like that. We need to understand from the storyteller's perspective what is desired and what is to be avoided. Making that clear really helps through the line of the story. For a scary story, those states could be Getting attacked by an axe or making it to safety for a funny story. They could be making a fool of yourself or winning them over. In any case, there should be some risk, some clear risk or award for the storyteller that hinges on the outcome of events. And also, put the audience in your headspace. For a scary story, it's not enough to say you were scared. You have to show the audience why by recounting the events as you experience them and the feelings, those events that turned up the moment. That's what you have to do. That's what you have to do as a storyteller if you are looking forward to sharing a story. A lot of people like to share stories, especially this time of season. It's spooky season, as they like to say. We're about, I think, just a few days until Halloween. Eight days away. It's a week from tomorrow. Then finally, something has to change. If everything remains the same, there's probably no reason to tell the story in the first place, right? I mean, what's the point of a story if nothing changes? They say, figure out what it is that changes in you because of the story. Because stories aren't that great unless you change somehow, she said. Or at least your perception. What's new? What did you learn about yourself while telling the story? Again, you could use that. You could use those tidbits. And facts to help you tell your side of a scary story. Or also, just talking by the water cooler if you need something to talk about. Headline number one. What national day is it today? Well, it is national TV talk show host day. Who would have thought? 
So on October 23rd, get ready to go live before a studio audience on national TV talk show host day. Created to pay tribute to the TV talk show host and appreciate their unique form of humor, entertaining stories, spontaneous wit, and timely political jokes. Talk shows come in a variety of platforms. Daytime talk shows provide a combination of current events, health updates, technology news, and entertainment. The later the hour, the more comedy the TV talk show host dishes out. From practical jokes, impersonations, sketches to games to sidekicks and audience participation, guests usually star in an upcoming film or made headlines for a stunt, good deed, or unusual invention. Each day we watch our favorite talk shows and we laugh, cry, listen, and learn. It is these great hosts that make the shows ones that we want to watch. Well, they've expanded their platforms and formats, not much has changed. They still fill the nights with humor and popular guests. A band that plays along and the audience that joins in the pranks too. How would one observe hashtag TV talk show host day? Learn about TV talk show history. Practice your talk show voice. Tell a few one-liners for your family or some scary stories. Discovery some of the history behind the comedy associated with late night talk shows. Do your favorite sketch or game played on a particular show? What's your favorite show tweeted out? And also, what's your favorite segment? Also, National TV Talk Show host Jose was chosen to celebrate on the king of late night television birthdays, Johnny Carson, who was born on October 23rd and was host of The Tonight Show for 30 years from 1962 to 1992. And there are over 1,500 national days. And today is National TV Talk Show Host Day. We just got to find out when Radio Host Day is because that would be a fun day. But again, National TV Talk Show Host Day. And once again, that's the top five news headlines of the day. Coming up next here on Power 88 Radio, we're going to be just giving a little look ahead to tonight's matchup between the Nationals and the Astros next on Power 88 and who possibly is going to win. Find out next on Power 88. Welcome back to Power 88 Radio, broadcasting live from Dean College. Alex Hughes bringing you up until 7.50 this morning again. And in the show a little early because we have an e-commerce conference on campus today. Uh, that starts at 8 o'clock, so we have to get over there uh, to sit in for that. But before we go to talk about the World Series matchup, Game 2 tonight, we are just going to give a quick weather update this morning. If you're walking around campus uh, or in the local area, it is a little rainy this morning, but the rain will be ending very shortly. It's actually going to be a pretty sunny day. Highs up to 65 degrees today and sunny. The sun's supposed to break through after the 11 o'clock hour this morning, and it's going to be a perfect fall day today. 65 degrees the high, and once 7 o'clock hits, it is going to drop down to about 60 degrees, and then it's going to be a nice dry night tonight. Get down to the 40s, um, and then looking ahead does not look good. After Saturday, it is supposed to rain Sunday all the way through Friday. Yes, you heard that correct. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday all have rain. So we are back to rainy Franklin, Massachusetts, everyone, and, well... Be sure to invest in Umbrella. It is worth it. Rihanna would tell you so. Anyways, that's a bad joke. But moving on to finish out the show, World Series Game 2 tonight. Justin Verlander on the mound for the Astros. Steven Strasburg on the mound for the Nationals. The Astros trying to get back into the series after losing a heartbreaker last night. The Nationals were able to strike back and to keep the lead that they put up against the Astros. And the Astros' offense, well, couldn't really put up enough runs to ma maneuver them above the Nationals. But the Astros are trying to do that tonight with future Hall of Famer Justin Verlander on the mound tonight and possibly Cy Young Award winner. He's in the con contention to do so. So what's the keys to the game for both of these two clubs? Well, 
Justin Verlander needs to pitch good, obviously. But he struggled in the World Series starts. He's pitched in three World Series. And, well, he's going to have to be Justin Verlander tonight. He can't be giving up four runs in the first inning. Because if the Nationals go up 2 nothing in this series, now you put the pressure on the Astros. A lot of pressure. And I'm sure that pressure is already building now. That was a must-win game for the Astros last night. To start out the series, up one nothing. Yes, the Astros lost the first game of the series against the Yankees. And then they lost both games in Tampa during the American League Divisional Series. But in the World Series, you've made it. There's only two out of the 30 teams that made the World Series, obviously, right? Pointing out the obvious here, but still. Only two teams out of the 30 make the World Series. You make it this far. You win the amount of games that the Astros did. It would be a failure if the Astros don't win the World Series this year. And especially going up against the Nationals who have been riding that hot wave since the last two weeks of the month of September. They finished a season on a nine-game win streak and they're trying to continue one of the hottest streaks an MLB team has ever been on. And it would be something if the Nationals were able to defeat the Astros. It's almost David versus Goliath in this series. Yes, the Nationals have a pretty well-built team, but going into the season, do they have a team to be built to win the World Series? No. And the reason why is because they lost their franchise player, the face of the franchise in Bryce Harper, who signed with the Philadelphia Phillies. And that's a story that's something special within itself, right? We talked about it on the show yesterday. You look back at teams like the Seattle Mariners. After Alex Rodriguez left and Kenny Griffey Jr. left, the Mariners started winning ball games, and then they got pretty dang good. And now we see it right now with the Nationals. If you would have told me that Bryce Harper would have left the Nationals and then the first year that he's no longer on the Nationals, they would have made the World Series, that's an ouch. A major ouch. But here they are in the World Series, up 1-0, going up against the Astros and Justin Verlander tonight. My prediction for tonight's matchup, Steven Strasburg shuts down the Astros' offense and the Nationals go up 2-0. Send it back to Washington for three games to see if magic can happen in the city of Washington, D.C. for the first time since 1930s. This is their first championship game that they've had in the city of Washington since the 1930s and possibly a new championship in the city. But once again, thank you for listening to the show this morning. Big show tomorrow. ESPN reporter live on the show tomorrow morning. Ariel Hawane, who is a MMA reporter and WWE reporter for ESPN Joining the show tomorrow morning, he's followed by 900,000 followers on Twitter, and he's one of the most important reporters in the MMA sport and the UFC and WWE. He's on tomorrow morning, and also on Thursday morning is Bill Brown, the former voice of the Houston Astros, a longtime voice of the Astros, joining the show on Friday morning. Once again, big show Big rest of the week planned out. But thank you all for listening. I'm Alex Fuse, and have a fantastic rest of your day. Be kind to one another.